Um, so my name is Francois. I'm 41. I have three kids. Um, but we, before we, we get into this, I'm just going to say we're going to present the farm shortly. And then after we'll go through some picture of the of what we're doing in here that might be interested for, interesting for you guys. So, okay, so I'm 41. I have three kids. I studied agriculture at McGill. Uh, graduated in uh, 2005. I worked as an agronomist uh, in the MAPAC, which is the government uh, of Quebec for agriculture here from uh, 2008 to 2016. Um, I got tired of the administration part of the job. So I started the farm in 2012 and moved on the farm on 2014. So we bought, we, uh, we built a house during that period of time and left the job uh, in uh, my full-time job in uh, 2016. So we had a four year transition between uh, the full-time job and the full-time farming, which were which really sucked. Actually, they, those were very bad four years. Um, we, uh, our main interest was growing vegetables, so agronomy. That's why we're, we're farming right now. We love to understand how the system works. We like to grow our vegetables uh, without harming the environment. And uh, we really have strong uh, interest in management and numbers. So you'll see on the next slide um, the registry we use on a farm. So we track uh, everything we do, where we do it, and we uh, we also track the time it takes to do uh, every every task, and that allows us to generate some nice um, analysis on the next slide, where we can separate per crop the time we spend there, the yields, the number of meter of bed in my uh, in my case, the gross revenue, the supply costs, and labor costs. Um, that allows us to concentrate on the most lucrative crops and, and understand why uh, we lose some money on other crops. Is it uh, the yield? Is it uh, the time spent picking? So that really helped us, uh, that really helped the business out. Um, next slide, please. Um, so uh, the farm, um, it's 60 acre, 85% tillable, uh, tile drain. So the idea that we had is to use the whole every acre at its best. So we constant we we're using 30 acre for field crop because it's more like um, uh, clay loam type of soil. Uh, we use eight acre of hay that we use as mulch uh, in our vegetables. Five acre of vegetable, uh, sweet potato, melons, and in the melons I put um, cantaloupes, canary, red seedless, and um, and butternuts too that are there. Green manure. Uh, we add 33,000 square foot of greenhouse, mostly for winter green and ginger. Um, so that's the um, business model of the farm is having a few crops that, and that we wholesale everything. Uh, we also have four acre of Christmas trees on where it's too, too slopey, uh, so we can cultivate in there. And 10 acre left for biodiversity, wetlands, and greenhouse uh, gas tree plantation. Um, uh, we have few buildings, a big barn for storage warehouse uh, with a 10 by 10 cold room. That cold room actually managed a whole production of the greenhouse, which is pretty cool. Um, and we try to do that with the equivalent of 3.2 employees full time plus me. Um, and behind you see my beautiful winter ride. So it was a great crop last year. So that's a um, satellite view of the farm. You see where the field crops are in the north. You see all the gardens. It's an old picture, so you don't see all the greenhouses, but uh, you, you can see the windbreaks that, are, that were planted, where the wetland is. You don't see the greenhouse trees, but they're there. You don't see the Christmas trees, but they're in that area too. Uh, our marketing. Um, so at Ferme Chapeau Melon, we try only grow to, uh, to grow only Prima, so to always be on the market, the first person on the market. Uh, that's pretty easy with the greenhouses, um, but we also try to do it uh, with our field crops, especially cantaloupes. Um, so as soon as the big bunch of vegetables are coming on the market, the price drop and we try to get out there, uh, get out there. So um, most of our marketing is wholesale. That, uh, that's the bigger part, which is purple, I guess, on your screen. Um, we also are selling melons to other farms at 10% of our sale, uh, mostly CSA's farm that don't want to break their head growing melons because it's heavy or it's tough or whatever. So we're very happy to provide melons to their clients. 
Uh, we're also a member of the CAFE, which is a co-op um, that does winter basket in the Montreal region. We do something like 1,500 basket in the winter, and we're something like 15 producer. We all grow our own vegetable, and then we pull all these vegetables together to make baskets all winter. We do very little retail. Um, that's not the business model, but uh, with the price of vegetable right now, we're trying to look seriously at developing this, uh, uh, this way of selling our vegetables. So this slide is what I, for me, it's the most interesting because that's where all our uh, challenges are. So we're aiming at, uh, at having half a million sale in 20, uh, in 2020, uh, 2020, 2024. Um, uh, there's a reason for that because we don't put any money aside for retirement and um, we don't want to uh, be in a situation in the 2025 year where we have to sell our land uh, to the market price for retiring. So since we have 2025 20, years to go, um, we 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 have time to put money aside and plan this in advance. So we'll try to do that. Um, so and the rest is um, is um, is other big challenge. So uh, right now the business cannot function without me. So I can't be replaced right now, which is which uh, is a big problem because since I'm the only one who can manage all this right now, um, my business doesn't have any value. So we'll try. To, we have to think find a solution to fix that up in the next 25 years. Uh, of course, prepare for transfer and um, build a farm that is resilient. That means that can um, provide um, um, good, um, that is profitable, whatever the, the, the season is. So that's what I meant. So that would be, I would be finished for the presentation of the farm. So we'll go through the, um, the picture of, if it's possible to go back to the previous slide, I would like to talk about the greenhouse design in the back. Um, so all of our greenhouse are arranged this way. Um, so the beds are perpendicular to the greenhouse. Um, and we found that we had great success with this because um, the uh, efficiency of the employees is so much higher with that um, design because it's every bed is easy access. So we, we can take the transplant in the greenhouse very easy and we can take the crop out of the greenhouse very easy. So the next slide, you'll see uh, that we're working uh, with permanent beds on the next slide. Yeah, um, so we have a disc better. Um, and oh, the garlic always follows the cantaloupe in our rotation. So that way we can have time to rip all the cantaloupes out and then uh, sow the green manure and then plow everything down with our disc better. And then uh, plant our garlic in there. Yes. So, um, so that allows us to uh, skip the, the fall fertilization uh, for the garlic. This slide with the greenhouse, uh, we had great success um, oversizing the size of the fans uh, of the greenhouses. Um, uh, that really, really helped us to keep the, the climate drier in the greenhouse, especially in February and March where the roll-up sides are stuck in the ice. In, in ice. So um, we install those huge fans in every greenhouse. And um, these fans blow cold and fresh air and dry air into a perforated uh, balloon. And so that distributes the cold and fresh air uh, all, uh, all, all around the greenhouse. We also have mosquito nets in every roll-up site. All right, so I've talked about the, um, uh, the hay, eight acre of hay that we're using as a mulch. So we have a complete mechanized system for doing that. It's a very old system with cheap machinery. Everybody can do it. Um, so um, we hay bind the whole field. We chop with this machine and blow it in the, in, the, in, the, in the wagon behind. Once the wagon is full, we take the chopper away and then uh, we put the wagon right behind the tractor and then drive through our alleys unloading the wagon. So we added a chute there so the, the hay drops uh, in between the rows. And of course, the, 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 the distance between the wheel of the wagon just fits our, uh, our rows in, into the field. What's most important there is the timing for hay cutting. 
which always has to be done on the second or third of July of uh, June here in Quebec at the farm. So that way you make sure you don't have wheat seed in your mulch. And uh, that's great because you don't need to wait for three days uh, good weather to do that. It can rain on it. It doesn't matter. You just use it as a mulch. So that's what it should look for at the farm. So that's where we're looking at. So you see the mulch. Uh, we also grow butternuts on plastic mulch. Uh, and then we use transplants too. Um, so we do that because we want to have to be the first on the market with butternuts. And uh, it also allows us to cure the, the butternuts in the field so we don't have to do it uh, in, uh, in, the, in the storage. Having buy a toolbar like this was a great investment uh, for us because one machine can do many things. You know, it's, machines are pretty expensive. They sit around uh, 360 days a, a year. So the more you can use them, the, the, the better it is. So um, with this kind of toolbar, we can put this better on them. We can put the shanks to, uh, uh, to help us lift the plastic after the crop. There's a blade that we can put there to lift the, the garlic. So one machine, multi-use, that was a, a good thing we did for sure. So there's two picture here. Um, one is because we had a lot of problems with crow that, and we solved this problem. Um, by hiring hunters that come to the farm pretty much every day to look around and shoot the crows. Um, we also added a fishing line on top of every uh, on top of every row of our melon field that we want to harvest. Um, so our post, so our, our rows are 165 uh, feet long. So there's a post on every end and then a fishing line in between. So since the fishing line is um, translucent, the crows, they don't see it when they're high and that when they're, they're, they're uh, flying by, they go closer and then they see it at the last minute and they get scared. And um, so that keeps them away. And we also have plant a trap crop of melon very far away uh, where there's no hunting pressure. So these birds are pretty uh, bright. So they quickly understand uh, where uh, they can feed on melon and where they can't feed on melon. So um, that way we solve the problem and that works very, uh, very well for us uh, since five years. Um, and we also grow uh, sweet corn in our greenhouses. Um, it only covers a variable cost uh, of, uh, of what we're doing for the, for the sweet corn. It is a great, great, great prima. So we're at least two weeks before anybody else on the market with sweet corn. So that's great. Um, sweet corn are C4 plants. Uh, they really, really like the greenhouse climate. They just grow like crazy. And, um, and it's great for rotation also, and especially with, with the winter greens, like we're always stuck with um, spinach family and uh, broccoli family plants. But having spinach in the summer just breaks uh, the disease cycle and adds a lot of organic matter uh, to our uh, to our greenhouse. So uh, that's um, that. Uh, I, th I thought that was interesting anyway for you guys. Uh, don't remember that we have mosquito nets, so uh, there's no no crows, no raccoons, and no butterflies that can feed uh, on the corn and uh, and uh, and cause any trouble. So um, I guess I'm done. Great. Thanks so much. And you have some time for questions. See if there are any. Well, I have. Not much yet. That was wonderful, Francois. Thank you. Um, Chris Callahan is just checking on the size of those huge fans that they're 1.2 meters um, square. Yeah. Is that yeah. yeah that's four feet. But what's most important is the cubic uh, feet per per minute that blows in. You can have different size fan, whatever, it's the speed and the number of cubic feet that can be uh, sent in the greenhouse. I have a question, where are you selling that uh, sweet corn? Is that wholesale as well or it's, it's not that much, right? It's just one or, how many greenhouses do you have at one time? Is it enough to wholesale or do you have to retail it? Yeah, it's enough to wholesale. We have between three and four greenhouses full of sweet corn in this in the summer, and we wholesale it through uh, some small distributors that who makes basket on the internet and sell and distribute it to uh, uh, to door to door. So we have that kind of clientele in our in our marketing. So yeah, that's where we sell it. 
And along those lines, Andy's asking how you manage tillage after the sweet corn in the high tunnel. Yeah, so um, we uh, we uh, we uh, we bought a chopper, a small chopper with a Honda engine. So we tried it. We we cut the the, um, uh, the stalks very close to the ground, and then we chip it. Uh, so we leave the chips there, and uh, usually we transplant uh, lettuce after or something like this. So we try to do transplant right after of sweet corn, and we leave the stalk there. So, but we cut it very close to the to the ground. So usually there's no um, there's not a big problem of doing that. And we you know we have kind of many problem related to um, to the because we till too we work our soil too much in a greenhouse because it's so rapid. There's so many rotations, so many crops. So uh, we really reduced uh, our tilling of our greenhouse soil. So working with transplants and stuff like this. Yeah. Tim Taylor is asking fishing line and crows is what he said. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah though, so we, we, we put that fishing line uh, on two posts and then uh, put some tension on it. So the fishing line doesn't lie, in, doesn't lie on the crop. Um, so our rows are five feet from each other. So there's one fishing line every five feet. Um, so the crows, when they're high in the sky, they don't see them. So they just uh, fly close to it and they see it at the last minute with the reflection of the sun and everything. And they get scared and they go away. Great. Okay, I think um, the caller from 703 can talk now. Hey, how's it going? This is Kyle from 1000 Stone Farm in Brookfield. Sorry, I couldn't um, type the the question. Um, we have, I'm just curious about these fans. We have um, four greenhouses um, up top on our upper fields that have each have four 5,000 CFM fans in there. And when I run those fans through the winter, it costs, <clears throat> it costs about $500 a month um, to run those. Um, in electricity, and I'm curious. What I've decided is that I, I'm not going to run them um, because the cost effectiveness of it to me doesn't seem to add up. Um, but my question would be: Are folks talking about that? Are we looking at those numbers? Um, because when I looked at it, it was a little bit um, shocking, I guess. Well, so uh, yeah. My question I, so is: I, Yeah, I guess it has to do with cheap electricity in Quebec. I guess only. Um, I didn't calculate it, but I've seen what it does on the crop. Um, so, um, yeah, um, that's all I can say, I guess. <laughs> uh, there's, uh, Chris put in a calculation there of uh, cost in Quebec, which looks like six cents versus 14 cents for the same unit of power. So, that may be part of the reason it works for you. 